I have uh, very strange feelings about following these guys talking on the, on the screen. <laughs> uh, the, and let me just talk about that so we can put this in perspective. I worked, as, she, as Sarah mentioned, I was a legislative director in the U.S. Senate for Gaylord Nelson, the founder of Earth Day. When I was, and I was also a legislative director and directed staffs in the House. And I have a very checkered career. You know, this is bad. I worked at the highest level of the State Department doing policy planning for the United, the United Nations policy. That was in the past. So I come out of straight politics, although it's, I'm a Wisconsin kid, so I come out of Wisconsin politics, which is a pretty progressive form of liberalism. And I've left that world some time ago. And I honor it. I, I'd rather have Obama in office, and I'd rather have a good liberal program going. Uh, I prefer that. I think it would be important for us. But what I've listened to these guys, um, in particular Romney, who, you know, <laughs> give me a break. The, uh, <laughs> it's like a little kid in school, bang, 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 bang. Uh, but also Obama, the, the trap that we can get lost in and it's a hard one to grasp. I think that they are working in such a constrained space. What they are allowed to talk about, what they may care about, and what we are allowed to hear is itself so limited that it tells you that there is a profound, deeper problem, a systemic problem, that has constrained the whole discussion both of what is possible and where we are in history and what we might do. So it just corners us. And that was my first reaction. So, so for instance, this is the wealthiest economy in the history of the world. It currently produces, currently, with massive unemployment and massive recession, $192,000 for every family of four. There is no economic problem. Let me say that again. We do not have an economic problem. We have a political problem managing the wealthiest system in the history of the world. That, those numbers will go up and up, and if we can handle the resource questions, the technology will continue to generate about a seven-fold increase over the century as it did in the last century. So the most bountiful possibility, even in a time of resource scarcity, is lost. We can't even think about it. And it becomes utopian just to say what economists know the numbers are. So put it another way. What can't be said, and the first part of this talk up briefly to say why, I, why we are in a very unusual systemic crisis, and why if we understand that it might allow us to move in a different direction. The first part I want to get that briefly on the stage and then talk about what I think is really interesting, the positive things that are exploding per force of necessity, out of the pain of the crisis, building forward in a way that I think is really interesting. But in terms of the crisis itself, how do you tell a systemic crisis? It's not only about the way the chatter is in the political sphere. If you see wages going steadily down and the top income for 30 years, 30 long trends tell you there's deeper mechanisms at work. So for instance, over 30 years, the top 1% has increased its share by 10%, meaning the bottom 99% has lost that, but it's a steady trend over time. Something's driving it. Power relationships are driving it. The, top, the number that I find most unusual and gives you a sense of what is systemic about it is the top 400 people, individuals, 400 people, could get them in this space if you squeeze just a little bit, have more wealth now than the bottom 180 million Americans taken together. That's a medieval number. I don't mean that rhetorically. I mean medieval society was structured with the ownership of wealth, in that case land, at that level of concentration and giving it power relationships of that kind. If you look at a different question, people have walked, looked at civil liberties. If you want to know what liberty is about, you actually look to see who gets deprived of their liberty. 
And if you look at the long trends which tell you about underlying mechanisms, the United States started about 50, 30 years ago, 50 people per 100,000 in jail. It's now up to 743 over time going up. A lot of black and brown people there. We have eight times as many people in prison or jail per capita than any other advanced country, including Russia. The loss of liberty is a trend. And we see it in terms of the legal and civil liberties, right? You can go into the legal matters of it, but just look at the bottom indicators. Climate change. Over the last 30 years, the increases in the various forms of gas that are incre increase, increasing global warming have gone up steadily. In the last two years alone, 3%. And you all know the numbers. There is no trend change. It's all going in the wrong direction. So something is generating the larger trends that you see, and they are not being ameliorated. There is a problem with the power level of power. So that presents kind of, they can't manage the economy in, let me just give you one last one just as a stagnation question. People often look at economists and they don't quite know all these numbers, deficits and so forth. Uh, I think uh, the best person who ever explained to me, and I'm a, you know, economist, uh, how the economy, how to think about the economy was my, my aunt, my aunt Isabel from Racine, Wisconsin, where I'm from. And she was, uh, she was a baker, she ran a little baker shop. And she, she remembers, she said, you know, during the Depression, there wasn't much money around. Just wasn't much money around. And then they had a big war, and all of a sudden, there's lots of money around. And the point of it was that it is not beyond the capacities of policy to run a, an efficient economy. It is beyond the capacities of the politics and the political structure, which makes it a systemic problem. You could run, you, you could put high levels, as Paul Krugman says every day, you could invest heavily and you could do it in a green way and you could put everyone back to work and you could manage it. That's not a difficult problem. The problem is the politics of doing it that nobody can manage in this system. So let me just say one more word about that and, and why I think we can begin to get a handle on why it is a particular odd kinds of, kind of uh, systemic crisis that it's difficult for people to get their heads around. In most political systems, the way in which the power of the corporation and the elites has been balanced throughout the Western world, throughout the Western world, and it's studied to death by political economists, is that it is not only politics and movement building and organizing for elections that allows some balance to the system against the 400 and the corporations they own. It is, in fact, an institution, and that institution has been the labor movement. Throughout the Western world, strong labor movements have allowed the election, even of environmentalists like Gaylord Nelson. You needed the labor institution. And that's why Governor Walker in Wisconsin and every Republican governor is going after labor, because if they cut that out, that institution, they pull the muscle out from under any kind of progressive politics. So they know what the, they know what the game is, and they know just what the political economists know. And what's happened, and why the oddity of the systemic crisis needs to be looked at in a new way, I think, is that, in fact, labor has gone down from 35.4% of the labor force in unions in 1953 at the peak. It's now at 11% and declining less than 7% in the private sector and will go further down. If you want to ask one simple question about why the system has no capacity to manage and why the underlying trends are increasing in the direction they're increasing, it's that the old balancing mechanisms that worked sort of in the, in the third quarter of the 20th century and then began to decay over the next 30 years, it is the decline of labor and the decline of that institution, which has pulled the whole system in a different direction. This is not just corporate capitalism. Throughout the Western world, it has been corporate capitalism balanced, sort of, by parties politically resting on the institution of labor. And that is dying. That is the name of the American systemic crisis as it deepens. For all of the problems and advantages of labor, that's what's going out the window, and that's where the trends are. There's a lot of reasons why labor's gone down. The most, they've been attacked, they've been race issues at the bottom of a lot of this, we could get into that. There's the Chinese, there's the, co the trade problems, et cetera, et cetera. But the thing to notice is that the system has lost its old way of managing a liberal political economy. 
and we are facing the trend result of that. A systemic crisis is one that doesn't get solved by politics as usual. To put it another way, is there any institutional way to alter the trends other than build a movement? You need a movement, absolutely. But we also know historically that unless we build new institutions with power over time, they win. And it could get very ugly. Now, what makes it a very odd and strange crisis, and then we'll go on to what's interesting about what's happening, but the context is critical, and I think as a historian, so I have to burden you with this. It is my Marxist friends see all of this and they say there will be a crisis and a collapse and maybe a revolution. Now, I, I honor some of the really good Marxist thought, but what's interesting about this particular crisis is in 1929, the economy was supported by a government that was 11% of the GDP, not very big. And the crisis was the collapse, there was no floor. The floor now is 34%. We may get decay and stalemate and stagnation, but we're not likely to get that collapse that's gonna cause a big explosion, in my opinion. <laughs> There's also the problem that the big explosion might go to the right rather than the left. But the most important point is <clears throat> we may get the stagnation that you're seeing and stalemates politically and ongoing decay, but that's a very different context. It's a very unusual context, so a minute just to think about it, and I burden people with this. It isn't a period of reform where the trends are moved forward in the old way, but it's not a period where there's a crisis collapse, like the Depression or a Marxist theory. It's very unusual. It's decaying and stalemated and stagnating and what we experience day to day, unemployment, underemployment, poverty, global warming, environmental issues all over the place. Odd, painful, but strange crisis. And I want to stress to you that it's important, I think, to grasp the nature of how odd it is because it has certain properties. One of which is the pain levels are forcing people to do new things because they have to. In a crisis, that isn't what happens. You get explosions. But what we're seeing, and this is the part that's very interesting to me, what we're seeing is an explosion of activity, both political, some social, but above all economic in a way that I think could matter. Now, let me say a bit about that. All the systems, all systems run on the basis one way or another of property. And in this one, the property concentrations are, as I've said, extreme and getting worse. The medieval ones, as I said, land was at the core of it. 19th century capitalism, small business ownership of capital was the dominant form of a very strange kind of competitive capitalism. Corporate capitalism has, comes in different flavors. Corporate domination at the end of the 19th century was pretty much just corporate power. The balancing game that the mid-century mid in all the advanced countries and now decaying, social democracy or liberalism it was called, that was another form of corporate capitalism. Still another one was fascism, corporate capitalism with repression. But the decay we're seeing, but the, at the core of these systems all is the question of property, who owns the wealth. And simply as one element of the way to think about what might be the possibilities of the next system and what might be the possibilities of building institutional power and displacing, pushing back over time, the dominant power of the system, it would have to revolve, I think, and we could have a long discussion, around some way to democratize the ownership of wealth. If it's 1%, or 400 people owning as much as the bottom 180 million, or 1% now owning more investment capital. This one's another. 1% 1 owns now more investment capital than the bottom 95% of the society. Either there is a way to democratize the ownership of wealth, or it stays as is. And either there's a way to do it in a democratic, decentralized way, 
or you end up with statism of the, so of the Soviet Union style. The conservatives are right about that. The state owning the capital under state socialism, as it was practiced, did concentrate power. So there's our problem. Stagnation, stalemate, decay. If you want another system, let me press you on this. Let me press you on this. We haven't done this, you and I. What is it that you want? You don't like this system? What do you want? It's no good to say change the system and then say, well, I, we need to think it through. And one element, and I'm, it's a real challenge to all of us, one element of it, in my view, is how do we begin decentralizing the ownership of wealth, both as a principle and democratizing it, but also as a way to begin step by step to building new power bases and new cultural bases in the system. What I just said in the 60s would, would have been called a, a heavy rap. <laughs> so, so let me repeat it, because so, I take it very seriously. <laughs> I'll bet my life on it, as a matter of fact, and I'm going to ask you to. If there is a way forward, and if we, you know, this is kind of simple logic. If we live in a systemic crisis, which means that you need to develop an alternative systemic response, then either we have a view of what that looks like, more than rhetoric, and an idea of a path, or we aren't talking about anything real. So, what does it look like? And how do we begin to think about it? I don't think anybody's got the real answer to this. I don't expect that. But I think directions are beginning to emerge largely because of the odd structure of the crisis and its pain levels that is forcing people to innovate. So one of the things we do in, in the Democracy Collaborative is we cover, it, we cover this field pretty closely. The press doesn't cover it because it doesn't have the money to, and time or interest to cover what's going on at the grassroots level in terms of democratizing ownership. But we try to grasp it. So here's a, here's a website for you. Community-wealth. Put the dash in. There's another one without. It's a different one. It's a good one, but it's not this subject. And we're, what we look at is what's going on at the grassroots level and around the country that is beginning to suggest a direction for changing the ownership of wealth in a democratic form. So when you begin to look, some odd things that come up first. There are 130 million Americans now involved in co-ops and co-op credit unions. 130 million people who have some involvement in a cooperative institution, one person, one vote. Many of those are credit unions. I was in Burlington, Vermont a couple months ago, and the Occupy movement was looking at the credit union, which is many credit unions, let's be honest, they're very boring, standard, they aren't doing much interest. They could, they're one person, one vote. The light bulb went on. Why don't they fund interesting worker-owned co-ops or other they're really interesting projects could be funded with some of the capital that's in those credit unions? So a number of these folks became members and voted in some new board members. You could do that, by the way. <laughs> So interesting thing going on, but 130 million people already involved in one person, one vote co-ops. There are 10 million people, 11 million actually, involved in 10,000 worker-owned companies around the country. Some good, some bad, some, some that could be better, but they're on the ground and they exist and nobody knows about it. There, there are four or 5,000 neighborhood-owned corporations around the country, some good, some bad, some very interesting indeed. We could talk about some large scale ones. There are 100 and with the last number I saw was 1,300 people working in New Communities Inc. in New Jersey, making money on a community based structure and using the money to hire other people for social services, health care, et cetera, in a mini ownership, democratized ownership structure. That's another one. There are social enterprises popping up everywhere in which profits are being turned into social good. There are more and more of these kinds of elements, all of which are share the idea somehow to change and democratize the ownership and use of wealth in a radically decentralized way. Now, what's interesting to me is first, just to notice this. This is a, one phenomena that's happening. And second, to watch the path of development. 
and this is the thing I, I would suggest you do. Probably there's a lot of it going on here. I'll, I know there's some work going on with Slice, and I'm just beginning to hear about some of the other things going on in this community. But the, every place we've gone, there is a phenomenon that isn't quite spoken of as a phenomenon. It's just good projects. But if you look at it slightly back, what you see is a trend line of development and sophistication and increasing sophistication and a path that is beginning to build towards innovation and power. Now, let me give you some personal example of that, give you this idea of how I think about it as a historian and how I propose you think about it with me because my own view is that we are building into the prehistory of the next great American revolution and what we are doing, just as in the two decades before the New Deal, we are developing experimentally, in my view, the potential for the great transformation that could come if we're serious. But let me tell you what I see in, in states like Ohio, because it gives you a kind of a model or a template of this. I was involved with the steel workers in 1977 in Youngstown, Ohio. The first big steel closing in the United States, Youngstown Sheet and Tube closed, 5,000 people were thrown out in the street. That was huge news in 1977 because it hadn't been happening. Now it happens every day, but in those days it was a big deal. And the workers and the, and the churches and the ecumenical coalition in that town, they knew the town was going to go down, and, and Youngstown has gone down since. So they said, why can't the steel workers, why can't we run this? Why can't we have a worker-owned company, 5,000 guys? Why can't we do it? They were mostly guys. There were very few women in those days. And so they organized, and they got the Carter administration to back them up with enough money to come up with a very, very sophisticated plan and a promise of $100 million in loan guarantees. Did very good political work around an idea. I just learned, by, by the way, that when Obama was organizing as a young organizer in Chicago, what he was working on was a steel mill inspired by the Youngstown case. Someone's doing a history of his early days. But the Youngstown story was a big story in those days. And they put on the map this real plan. They got even the conservative governor forced into supporting it. And then, of course, after the election in 1978, the money disappeared. And the Carter administration backed off and did the usual political thing. And they didn't get their money. However, and this is what's, what's interesting about it for those of you who want to play this game, they understood that they were, might lose this game. You want to play for big stakes? You don't always win. And so they did a huge political education project along with what they were doing. And now in the state of Ohio, you probably have more worker-owned companies than in any other state per capita all over the place because they understood the task was to build for the long haul as well as what they were doing. So second thing, the International Steel Workers Union in 1977 saw these young activist upstart union guys in Youngstown and they didn't want them getting their jobs back. They played a rough game. They said, these guys are going to win that game. They're going to challenge us at the international level. We're going to have trouble. What do we need those guys for? They fought, the international union fought the local guys and said, you know, they lose their jobs. People were going out in the garage and killing themselves, their families at that point. And the international's view was, you know, we're not going to do this. And though no one can prove it, but we think that they and the steel companies went together to the Carter administration to kill the deal after the election. But in any case, they were publicly opposed to it. Played a rough game. Now, 30 years later, do you think as a historian or as an activist or maybe even a revolutionary, now the steel workers have come around and the steel workers are now working hard to set up worker-owned companies. That's happening in many unions, by the way. That's a big tilt because they realize that they are, either there's a new direction that builds institutional power, not just politics, that democratizes the ownership of wealth, really, worker-owned companies in that case, or the game's over. So the steel workers over time have flipped. And in the state of Ohio, there's all these worker-owned companies that came out of this interesting fight. More interesting still, there's innovation building on it. And this is how I see it in terms of developmental thought and, and urge you to think about it this way. In the city of Cleveland, now, I don't know if any of you have been to Cleveland letter, or Detroit, or St. Louis, or Baltimore. They look like bombed out cities. You know, Detroit, where my wife is from, a million people 
gone. And they all look at the trite and say, oh my God, it's terrible. They also don't ask, where did the people go? Where did they go? Nobody cares. It's, oh, Detroit. But in any case, Cleveland lost 300,000 people from 900,000 to almost 400,000 people. In one of the poorest neighborhoods of Cleveland, this is Ohio, what I mean by poor neighborhood, the average family income is $18,000. 40% unemployment, high level of crime, extreme poverty. In that area, there is a development in complex of very sophisticated worker-owned firms, not small scale, building over time and building a whole complex that is extremely innovative, building on the experience of development gone on over the last 30 years and adding to it. So for, what do I mean by that? So for instance, they are just about to open the largest, largest greenhouse, urban greenhouse, partly solar in the United States. These are not tokens. Three million heads of lettuce a year will be its output. Cleveland is an area that in Ohio imports almost all of its lettuce, for instance, from the West Coast on enormous carbon costs and enormous waste and a very great cost. And they are now setting up worker-owned, advanced company. Another one, the solar installation company, worker-owned, is about to install over the next two years double the capacity of solar, solar capacity in the entire state of Ohio, they will put in twice as much in the next three years. Worker on company. And the green, another one of them, the greenest laundry in the entire Midwest uses about a third of the energy and a third of the water. It's an industrial scale laundry, can, can serve the hospitals and so forth, is on the ground in a, in a platinum lead building. And it is also worker owned and it's part of this complex. Moreover, they've taken the idea of worker ownership to a very different level. This is democratizing wealth. Worker-owned companies, I'm an advocate of worker-owned companies and co-ops, but I don't get too romantic about them. The plywood companies that Sarah was talking about have been well studied. Worker-owned companies tend to sometimes become very insular and just protect the workers in that company without interest in the community, and often without environmental interest. Sometimes, and in the case of the plywoods, the study, if you looked at the profile, their politics was Republican. So worker-owned companies on their own may be positive, they may be negative, but one has to be thoughtful about it. But what's interesting about the Cleveland model is that they are linked together with a community vision. So it's a nonprofit corporation that owns part of these companies They can't get up and leave that 10% of their profits go back to a revolving fund to set up new companies. They're going to do about two a year. The goal is 5,000 over the next 15 years. And they're building a community building structure, integrating worker ownership into a different model. That's really interesting. That is very interesting. If those are you interested in design problems, you want to design a system and you think community and community importance, there's a real interesting model there. And again, for those of you who want to talk about what, what's the system look like? Tell me about it. Well, here's another feature of this Cleveland development. You probably didn't hear about it. The press doesn't cover this stuff. In that neighborhood, with that level of poverty, there are big hospitals and universities. Cleveland Clinic was mentioned tonight. Cleveland Clinic is right there, right in the middle of this poor neighborhood. University Hospital's there. Case Western Reserve is right there, right in the middle. They have a lot of public money. Medicare, Medicaid, education funds. They purchase in that particular area three billion dollars, with a B, not an M, of goods and services a year, leaving aside their salaries and leaving aside their construction budget, just what they buy. None of it from that area until now. So all of a sudden, the light bulb's gone. Why don't we use this enormous publicly funded purchasing power to help stabilize and buy from these co-ops and build out the whole system and develop it? And that is, in fact, what's now happening in this area and in Atlanta and in Pittsburgh and in Washington, D.C. and in Amarillo, Texas, of all places, very conservative, picking up on this model 
And there are discussions following it in Milwaukee and Chicago and several other cities looking at this model. Now, it's ex the greenest model and it democratizes wealth. And very interesting to me as a political economist, and let me urge this on you. Some of you who want to think about models, want to think about if you don't know where you, what is it you want, and if you don't know, why should we listen to you? You want to change the system? That model is very interesting because it, it is a partial planning system, purchasing power, stabilizing worker-owned companies in a community-building design, still using part of the market to keep them in check. That's not state socialism. That's not corporate capitalism, it is a mini version of a systemic design of a very sophisticated order. We could go into that if we had time, but uh, uh, think about it. And think about this, the politics of it is working. Even the small businessmen like it. You get below the level of ideology at Washington, you get back to Racine, Wisconsin, where I'm from, and you talk to the kids I went to high school with, very conservative, very smart, and they get it. It helps the community, it changes ownership, it's, why not? It's very American as well. But it is also an extremely interesting design if you project it up. So for instance, we've been writing about this and doing research on it. In our next system, which will have a lot of mass transit and high-speed rail, all publicly paid for, and all publicly paid for, and we have no capacity whatsoever to build it now in the United States. We import what we do, we do some assembly, for the French and for the Italians who have com companies and the Germans. When we have that vision, we will have a big, big, big contracts and somebody's gonna build it, public money. And it could well be worker community owned structures just upscaling what's going on in Cleveland using that planning principle and those markets. So that's just a sketch of how you begin to think of the political, political economy of the next system. If you don't like capitalism, you don't like socialism, you want to move in a new direction, etc. It's a community building structure based on changing the ownership of wealth. But I digress, that's a long vision. What's interesting to me is the process that you see, and I've sketched all too briefly, in Ohio, is a process that I believe you're going to see happening or could happen this is where we come in, or could happen when we actually rise to the knowledge that we actually could make a difference moving to the level of systemic change. It can be done any place. Now, that's only one model, but the conditions in Ohio are being replicated in many parts of the country, and on my view, come back to the beginning of this discussion, in a context of ongoing stalemate stagnation and decay, rather than collapse, which could go to the right just as easily as the left, and rather than reform, which was the old thing we liberals were able to do for a little while when we still had a labor movement, but in this odd, strange place where the pain levels increase and the decay increases, people get that either they invent and create or it gets worse. And then there's some interesting models. Some of them, I mean, there's a whole other side of this, which wonderful things going on in smaller co-ops and green and the food movement and the cultural aspects of this. All this ties in building community in many other forms. But some of the structural ingredients of actually a political economic system that could in fact get us the kind of ideas we want in place are also beginning to suggest themselves out of real experience and out of the pain levels of this odd context. Now, I'm not naive. I've, I've run political real campaigns. I've been in the middle of Washington. Uh, I'm hip. <laughs> I get it. So I'm also cynical. I do not take ideas about you can change the system seriously in utopian ideas without some, some bit of thought. So a suggestion to you. Most of us have a built-in notion that we really can't. I'm talking to the person in your chair. Who, us? Change the system? Now, I don't mean rhetorically. I mean as a real, viable, doable thing, like other people have done in many other countries, that we might actually do something like that and alter the power relationships in the most powerful corporate capitalist system in the history of the world. 
So, so my suggestion to you is that yes, that's the question on the table. And it is not beyond human capacities to think about it in a rational way. So my suggestion to you is this possibility. One of the other things that's happening in the development of these projects, I've been emphasizing the ones that democratize ownership that are popping up out of the pain levels. But one of the, there are many other forms, and many of them are much more very interesting, the kind that I, I talked about earlier in terms of the food movement and other environmental parts of this. But one of the things that's also happening, and it's at the level of what people call the sociology of knowledge, or the Germans call Weltanschauung, like worldviews. Out of this is also coming a process which is grinding up the traditional worldview. People don't believe anymore in the old stuff. They don't quite believe if you elect either one of these guys, and I'm for Obama, that much is going to change. It's a very big deal when people don't believe the old stuff. It's a very big deal when it doesn't doesn't quite register anymore. That is, the, to put it in different language, what I think you're seeing is a legitimation crisis in this formative years. A legitimation crisis is one in which the guiding ideals of the system, liberty, equality, democracy, ecological sustainability, when those ideals are contradicted by the reality of the trends, then the legitimacy of the existing system becomes eroded because the real world does not fulfill the ideas that give legitimacy to the system. And then people say something's wrong. I believe we're entering a period where people, even the Tea Party, liberty, there's, some, look, there's a lot of nonsense going on, but there's also this concern about liberty that some of it's real. A system that begins to enter that phase historically is really at a place where people can begin either to make a dis difference or you know, it could go a different direction. So there is, that's the negative. But the positive is what's happening on the ground, and particularly among young people, where a whole different vision of how to live and how to build society and how to build relationships and culture and the environment and projects, that's also developing not only in what I call projectism, lots of projects, it's developing an idea system. It's developing the preliminaries of a vision of what we might want that is heavily oriented to community, to, to ecological sustainability, to a different way of treating each other, and to some ideas about democracy and democratization as well. So it isn't only the stuff on the ground that I see bubbling up and that the press doesn't cover, and it, I see advancing to more and more levels of sophistication, and then the unions coming in and picking up, and that process that isn't being covered, and which would take decades to develop its power. It is the double level declining vision of ideas at the level of the sociology of knowledge or legitimation crisis, and also a recurring buildup of where we're going to take this. A majority of people between the ages of 18 and 30, when asked, do you prefer capitalism or do you prefer, prefer socialism in the most recent surveys, a majority say socialism. Odd. I don't think they know what they mean by that term. I don't think it tells you much. It tells you something that people don't believe the old stuff. Amazing. Those are the people who are going to build, and, you know, people like us are getting on. People in that age are going to build the next society. And people are open, I think, to thinking big thoughts over time. So my suggestion to you is this. There are several, if the processes I'm talking about, and we could add, let me give you some additions to it, because it, in all this brief, there are many, many states now are trying, there are 20 states that have introduced legislation to try to set up state banks like the State Bank of North Dakota. Another 20 states have set up legislation, have, are considering legislation to do single payer, like it's going to happen in Vermont, and it was twice vetoed. It passed the Senate, House and Senate in California, it was vetoed twice by Schwarzenegger. What's, what's happening at that level of institutions, banks and health and healthcare, I believe is going to intensify healthcare, particularly because the cost pressures are so severe that the only way you can get at it is single payer, and it'll probably be done state by state. And some of the big corporations will be for it too, because it, it changes their cost structure in international competition. So I think if you look at a 30-year swing, which is, you want to play this game? The chips are decades of your life. Yeah, you want to do system change? Dec you, gotta you have to be willing to throw decades. Anyway, I think the next few decades are going to see that whole healthcare system forced into single payer because the pressures are so great. You're talking 20% of the economy. 
not small change. Hopefully we can revise it to make it 10% when you get the efficiencies out of it, but that's the number. And some of those big banks are beginning to move at that level, and as many cities are setting up city-type banks or using city deposits to support credit unions that do local development. So that's another trend going on in the financial sector. There's another big trend going on. Every financial expert I know, left, right, and center, predicts with certainty, they shouldn't be quite that certain, but that they are very certain, that there will be major national financial and international financial crises repeat, recurrent. And at some point, you're going to see the big guys in New York taken on, the, the, the current nostrum is break them up. And probably that will happen at some point when the next big crisis hits, or maybe the one after that. And, and then they'll regroup, and the, you know, the big fish will eat the little fish. And at some point, the end of that line is nationalism, because there, there is no option. That particular line of development, by the way, is a conservative argument put forward by the Chicago School of Economics, because they understood that re they understood better than most liberals that regulatory strategies were regularly captured by big corporations. And they concluded explicitly that in many cases it's better to nationalize them if you couldn't break them up and if you couldn't regulate them. Why? Because they were interested in free enterprise small business capitalism and the big guys were screwing that up too. So believe it or not, I got the New York Times to take a piece on that, which they ran. <laughs> but, but I believe, without saying this, with, I believe that the pattern in the financial sector is going to be that pattern of being massive challenge crisis and at some point some parts of that's going to be made public because there is no option. I, I'm not interested in, in rhetoric or kind of we ought to do things. I'm interested in whether the situational logic that is emerging permits different possibilities and that's another, healthcare and banking are another one. So if you want to just open up the stage again if you're looking down the 30 year perspective and some of the big stuff. Did any of you notice that we happened to nationalize two of the biggest auto companies in the history of the United States in crisis? Happened. We gave them back after they start making money. But do not forget that it has happened and will probably happen again with some bigger industry. Now I'm blue skying for you. But what I'm suggesting is that if it is the case, and I think it is, that we are entering an extremely strange systemic crisis in which the old model of balancing the corporation sort of with a labor union based politics and a social democracy or liberalism is decaying, but it doesn't collapse and it's forcing people and let me put it another way, that kind of a crisis has one very positive feature. It allows people to learn to develop. A crisis, you know, my friend Chomsky's on to this one big time. A crisis often produces the kind of reaction that turns out to be just as bad as what you had or maybe, but a period in which learning of actually how to democratize things really, it's not easy, you have to learn. That's a positive feature of an odd crisis of the kind I think is emerging, a very positive, because if people learn how to do things really in their guts and in their reality, it's deep. And you project those principles and that culture forward, maybe. So now, enough utopian talk. Here's the options, as I see them. Look, look if the, you could have this decay, just goes on. Uh, Decay, 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 de Rome decayed. That is one option, it may happen. It is possible that out of the decay and the inevitable violence it will engender, there will be a right wing smash in some form of corporate state. Friendly fascism was the term that used to be used by one sociologist, that's possible. It is possible, look at Latin America. And those of you who think, by the way, that even corporate state fascism is the end of the line, look at all those dictators that are gone. It is possible, just possible, that if people get serious, this is not about systemic, it's about us getting serious, I think. The, pro the problem is existential as much as anything else. It is possible that if people like us 
actually can say, you know, really begin to get serious about this stuff, we may be able to, in practice and in ideas and in culture and in institution building, lay down the foundations irrefutable and irreversible, possible, so that this becomes the genuine prehistory of a transformation. That's also one of the logical possibilities. So that's obviously the one to bet on, but the, not too lightly, please. I did mean that about the existential issue. My experience in myself and in my friends and in most of the people I know is that we don't quite really want to take ourselves that seriously. No, I, I'm just doing my project here. It's a nice project, really good friends. What are you saying? They, besides all governments and states and all, they are never work. If they don't work, they will control us. So, yeah, that's what I said before, heavy rep. I'm, by the way, I'm speaking to the person sitting in your seat. <laughs> so my suggestion to you is, yes, it is possible that we are, it is that we are living in a systemic crisis. It is a very unusual one. It is also generating, genu genu generating a whole series of interesting possibilities that begin to suggest power relationships and cultural relationships and practices that could be generalized. And that the context we're entering may very well be such that it may be possible for determined people who take themselves seriously to lay down self-consciously the foundations of the next transformation. I could leave it at that, but I do want to remind you, and probably this is a good place to stop and then we can get into questions. That ain't what those guys were talking about. <laughs> They're working and I feel somewhat sorry for them. They're living in, I mean, I've, I've lived in Washington. They're living in this little frame of a decaying system, boxed in by the changing power relationships and not able to actually open up some of the things probably Barack Obama would love to think about, maybe not quite as far as I've been suggesting to you. But the frame is tiny, and the loss of real energy that explodes when people actually get the possibility that they might have, that's also evident in the kind of chitter chatter. The tone of it all is lost. Because what comes along, I think, and this is the last thing I'll say about this, don't trust me if I ever say that again, because I'll usually go on. What's interesting about the possibility, um, and I say this very coldly as a historian. Some of you from the 60s will remember this. Uh, what's really interesting about the possibility when a viable possibility begins to be taken really seriously is it unleashes extraordinary energy. Movement energy that is something that is powerful when you, it's palpable when you actually see it happen or part of it. And the, the women's movement was part of that, the environmental movement for a while, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement of the 60s, is explosive and you see it in some countries where they begin to see a flame is touched. And then you see human energy added to this whole equation of a very different order. But it takes a lot of building up to get there. So just on the final note on that, and this is the last thing I will say about that. You know, uh, Chairman Mao used to say, um, power comes from the barrel of a gun. And in the 1960s, the American women's movement said something very different. They said, no, 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 no. Power comes from six women getting together over coffee or something, reading something, talking to each other, digesting the ideas, figuring out a project, and then supporting each other to do it. I think they were, they were right. And I think that is the message for the building of the next American system. So thank you very much. I do agree with you that there are new possibilities growing up around and it's positive, but there is something I worry about and I would like to hear your, uh, your feedback on that, which is the national debt 
the national debt now is at $16 trillion and is growing by more than a trillion dollars every year. Somebody will have to pay for that somehow. Uh, how do you see that developing over the coming years? Eh? Oh, that's a... Uh, and a funny, this is... That, that, that's where the economists have got you. I, I'm, you know, um, World War II, the debt was far greater as a percentage of the economy. Just to notice, in all of these countries, the the debt. You know, there's one one thing. Who was the last Who was the last vice president? Uh, Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney once said, "Deficits don't matter." Now I'm a left Keynesian. They don't matter if you can run a high, you can run. This is, I mean, it gets you complicated right now, but if you can run a high growth system or even a, not gro growth in the production, but it could be green growth, so the actual output is different in terms of what you get. So, so long as you keep that financing, that's a number created by the Federal Reserve Board. Money is, money is created, as you know, by the waving of a wand in a computer. The, there's a wonderful, read the work of Ellen Brown, or the, what's called the Ellen Brown is very good on this, who's a, who writes about this in popular, but there's a whole school called the New, America, New Monetary Theory, and it comes out of left Keynesian thought. But what, look what's happening in the banks, banking system in Europe right now. The central bank is creating money. Where do you think it comes from? There's no little pot of money. It's magically created. What it is is a promise to pay, and those promises to pay can stay there as a deficit for till the cows come home if that's the way you want to run your economy. I, mean, I, I, I wish we had time to go into it, but the conservative politics of this is so wrong-headed, and they got the public so banged up on this that it, I recommend Helen Brown as a way to starting point on this. Yeah, sir, I sorry have, I can't do better in the time available. I have two extremely short, simple, and relatively unimportant questions, each of which has a one-word answer. Um, <laughs> good. Uh, the first one is you mentioned a website, community-wealth, is that dot .com, dot .org, dot dot org. Either way. Dot .org or either way. We've okay. got just both ways. And the second, the survey you mentioned about people preferring capitalism or socialism, was that over um, a survey of typical Americans or worldwide? Oh, no, that was Americans. They're, they're, that was young people in the United States. There have been three of them, actually. They've gotten stronger each time. I think I cited one of them in the introduction to America Beyond Capitalism. But if not, go to my website. There's several times. Thank you. Sir. Uh, what do you think... Uh, through the growth of nanotechnology, robotics, computerization, we are moving in the direction of a zero work homeostatic economy where the production of everything that humans need and want will happen with zero human labor. What's the effect of that? Well, leaving aside the word zero, we might approach asymptotically, as they say. Uh, Look, it's the, the, the technologies of extraordinary possibilities for human development. That is to say, to, to the extent we can reduce the necessary work. This is the world that Karl Marx was talking about, where there's time for the for philosophy, where time is opened up. People, that what you're talking about is the possibility of opening up real time for human fulfillment. And the technologies are extraordinary if we can develop them and use them as I said, you could cut, today you could, I mean, today in the United States, given the, exi the existing technology, you could give every family of four $100,000 in a 20-hour week. That's what, that's what the current productive capacity is, and that largely comes out of the technologies. And that's going to increase. Now, there's whole issues of how we deal with the resource aspects of that, but the technology allows for freedom for the first time in human history if we can master and use it in a way that's intelligent. Re today, in the United States of America, you can do $100,000 in 20-hour week. That's what the GDP permits in, if you can manage the distribution of it. So yes, it, I don't know if it's going to get to zero, but the, the technologies are very important. Great, great fruit, a great boon. OK, uh, talking about the uh, trends in political economy that you were talking about and the extreme concentration of wealth at the top, in the top 1%, and now, thanks to things like Citizens United, that even more greatly enables the concentration of political power at the top with that great wealth. When you talk about these uh, experiments in new systems, um, in democratizing wealth, 
presumably that's uh, not very appealing to those people who have concentrated a lot of power at the top. What kind of pushback have we seen against that, those democratizing experience, uh, experiments? And as they continue to, to grow and be, become larger segments of the economy, what kind of pushback do you expect? Well, it, it's, I'll, let me say two or three different things about that. Uh, we haven't seen a great deal of pushback. I expect if, we, if there is significant power, there will be, although the person mentioned banking, many of the banks are nervous in the state of Maryland that the banks don't want to see it. In many states, they're fighting back against state banking. But they may or may not win. We'll see how that goes. Some states will win. The language here, I think, is interesting. Um, and I've been writing about this. So what you're getting is what I call checkerboard possibilities. The, first, the things I mentioned about worker-owned companies and so forth, there's an evolutionary reconstruction is the terminology. This is not reform, it is the construction in an evolutionary form of new institutions. In the case of the banks, for instance, it's a checkerboard for some states, some cities, but also encircling, encircling in an odd way as the pain deepens. Uh, I suspect they will fight and get tougher. Uh, they may win, but not always. Um, what's interesting to me, if you, if you think about this, the internal empire of the United States, that's the way Madison thought about it, by the way, as an empire, internal empire. And the way Madison thought about it, by the way, just parenthetically, was just the way I've been talking about it. The people with the property are the ones that control. That's, that's Federalist 10. And the problem of politics is to keep the people without the property from taking and running the system. And the way you do that is you spread them out and divide them. Short, that's shorthand for uh, Federalist 10. However, What's also interesting is in the farther reaches of the internal empire, Detroit, Cleveland, they don't reach to every level and they can't solve every problem. And the pain continues. So it is certainly possible that they will crush everything. And it is also possible to make that assumption at the outset and do nothing. But it is also possible History is filled with places where those with power are toppled. And you pay your money and you seize what happens. Yep. Um, I don't know how close I'm supposed to get to this thing. Um, you uh, spoke a lot of good information regarding fiscal and economic policy. Uh, one point I did hear you say, though, about a new American revolution, and I'm and I'm paraphrasing, but when Benjamin Franklin was asked about the Constitution, what is it? He said, well, we've given you a government, beep, 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 if you can keep it. Yep. And so I was just wondering about your ideas about convening a new um, constitutional convention that uh, a lot of people don't <laughs> know history, but that the elites might, the parties might actually get together and say, you know what, maybe it is time to rethink um, terms of, uh, of uh, election, election, and uh, we look at apportionment because that's part of the problem. We're, we're getting representatives who are becoming more like senators than representatives because it keeps it keeps growing in terms of the number of constituents. So I'll just stop there, but I wanted to get your uh, take on, on a, uh, a constitutional convention. I'm against the constitutional convention now, because they got all the chips. But ultimately, it's implicit in what I've said, ultimately the, you would be talking about restructuring the design of the system, which would re ultimately require reconstitution. I mean, the constitution's an archaic document of 200 years old, it was written in the time of the mule and, 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 and the wooden plow. And it's honored and kind of festered. And, but give me a break. If you actually look at it, it is a document not appropriate to the 21st century. However, let it sit, because it would get much worse the powers that would run a revision right now. I do want to say something about the, that, that I'm glad you raised it, because one of the things I didn't mention, which is just built into the logic of at least how, how I think about it, so I'm burdening you with how I think about it, lots of things, so let me throw this one at you too. Um, the, this is a society of 318 million. 
the Census Bureau high projection for the rest of the century is one billion. That's the high projection, but five to six hundred million is well within, seven hundred million is well within the possibilities. This is a continental scale system. We don't often realize how big it is. We make comparisons with European countries. You can tuck Germany into Montana. They're, I sometimes tell my students, they're dinky little countries. <laughs> I mean, just to get the scale issue. So you tell me how you have participatory democracy in a continental system of seven or 800 million people. Inevitably, there's gonna be decentralization in the next system. And most states are too small and the continent's too big, which probably means regional restructuring of some kind. And there's a whole literature on that that came out of the 30s. And by the way, the Northwest is really a nice place to play with that. New England is also, they're really talking regions now. So, but really, th instead of thinking about that abstractly, actually, what would it mean if we were serious about designing a system that actually took the scale issue and democracy seriously? It would have to be decentralized and probably regions, and there might well be the cultural basis of it in this region. People tell me that that's a possibility. So, and Gore Vidal, well, Gore Vidal picked it up from the historian William Appleman Williams, who was one of my teachers long ago. William Appleman Williams used to write about this. But there's a whole conservative, honor some conservatives, by the way. Some of the conservatives are really thoughtful about this. Very interesting. You know, some of them are crazy and I disagree with them, but there, there are some genuinely thoughtful ones. Sir. Sir. Um, so say that you, uh, you or your community owns like a community space and you see that in the future, currently you hold this community space, you may not own it, you may own it, but you see that over time there's a trend that the property values will go up to the, even if you own it, the taxes will go up. So what are some tools uh, to keep some of these community run businesses that we already have viable in the future uh, through uh, changes in property trends, I guess. Great question, great question. And indeed, that's a question that's being faced, and there's a lot of experience on the ground. The most, po the most powerful tool is a land trust, where you actually, you, <laughs> that's, another, that's another one of the democratizing things that's popping up all over the, by the way, uh, land trust, you draw a circle around the land, or, and you set up a nonprofit corporation, you owns the land, uh, that's the typical way, you can actually do it through city government too. And so that if you get property value increases, they don't generate high cost housing because you can control that. You can tilt the internal subsidization within the land trust. I'm going fast. I'm just have to. It's, it's, it's a way to control what you're talking about. And it is really interesting. You can also do really interesting ecological things with it. And here's another example. In, 19, in the late 1960s, there were two land trusts in the United States and people thought they were crazy. One was in Western Massachusetts by a guy named Bob Swam and the Sherrods, George, Sherrods in George, Western Georgia set up a land trust, they're agricultural. Sh uh, Sherrod is the woman, by the way, who, who the Secretary of Agriculture kicked, fired, and then hired back. She comes a radical civil rights activist. And that idea was crazy. Now you can find, because there is no answer for the problems of gentrification in many areas, land trusts are popping up everywhere. There are Irvine, Californians doing 5,000 units. Washington's doing 1,000 units. Chicago's doing it. So it's another form of democratization at the decentralized way to solve a problem. And it's another example of this evolutionary reconstruction I'm talking about that is not, it's very American practical stuff. I mean, I'm putting it in a you know, frame of evolution, revolution, all this system change. You can drop that if you want. It's very American style. The European guys who, they don't quite get this. This is, this is one of the advantages of this country. It has a kind of populist, creative, pragmatic streak. And it's to be honored <laughs> and used. And land trust is one of the ways of dealing with that problem. It, it, that website will give you a whole lot of information on the most interesting ones. Good. Sir. So I'm, um, I'm curious with the- May I interrupt? Um, oh, sorry, uh, you are the last person to ask a question. And then uh, Mr. Aperovis will be signing books so you can ask him any more questions there. I'll make it a quick question. Uh, so I'm curious with, with the projects that you've worked with and studied in the Midwest, particularly some of the cooperatives, if they've kind of discussed any uh, mechanisms to put in place to deal with um, shocks in the global economy, given their linkage to the global economy. So like, for instance, in food production, that might not be as critical if it's local, but in steel, it would be really important. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, given the volatility of like the global financial economy, how small groups like that 
can absorb those shocks, I guess. So, so far, most of what we've seen is not deeply implicated by the global economy. So, so it's, and it's, this, this, let me just sharpen this design problem. By the way, let me outline it. There's a really big difference between vision and systemic design. I want to underline that. Vision has to do with the values and democracy and culture. But a systemic design is actually how do you put the design together, like an architect or an engineer, that would actually work. So the Cleveland model is a specific design with a, trying to structure it. And in that case, they're using, they're pretty well insulated from the global market because they're not in manufacturing and so forth. But I suspect if we get to the other levels, we're going to face that problem. And it'll require, it's going to require a different trade policy. It's going to require a different planning policy. But we haven't gotten there yet. So at least it's a good problem for you to work on. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for staying. Thank you for staying. <laughs>